says, Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Hello, everyone. This is Monica Dennington, and today we are going to begin a very exciting series on the nature of God, the person of God, and specifically, we're going to be looking at the concept and the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, today we're going to begin by asking a very important question, and that is this. Is it necessary to believe in the Trinity in order to be a Christian? Now, for most of us in uh, the Christian realm, the answer to that question seems obvious because we have built the foundation of our faith upon uh, many doctrines, including the doctrine of the Trinity. It's, it's the basis of for what we believe about who God is. But the truth of the matter is that if we want to know the answer to the question, we can't go to our doctrines. We have to go to the foundation that God has given us. And he never told us that our foundation is our doctrine or um, the, the ideas or philosophies or explanations of religious leaders about God. He said that our foundation is the word of God. God and the teachings of Jesus Christ. You see, the scriptures tell us that the secret things or the mysteries belong to God. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So we see that there are mysteries that God wants to make known to us. And we're also told in scripture that God has made his mystery known to us the mystery of who he is through Jesus Christ. As it says in John chapter one, starting in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the father's side has made him known. And that of course is referring to Jesus Christ himself. And again, in Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27, Jesus himself tells us all things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So we see very clearly that God tells us that he has chosen to reveal himself to us, the mystery and the secret of who he is through Jesus Christ. So in order to answer our question that we are addressing today, do you have to believe in the Trinity in order to be a Christian? The only thing we need to do is look at what Jesus taught about the Trinity. And the answer is he didn't. That's right. Look it up, you guys. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. You can look up Trinity. You can look up God in three persons, which is um, one of the ways that the Trinity doctrine is expressed. You can look up the word triune God, which means three in one. Um, you're not going to find any of those terms in Jesus teachings or in any of the written scriptures. So the question is, why are we using these terms to describe the mysteries of God if Jesus didn't choose to use them? And the answer is very simple. It's the same problem that we've had from the very beginning. We try to take God's mysteries and explain them in our own words. Now, scripture is very clear. We're going to go over this one more time. Scripture is very clear that we are not to add to God's words. Okay, that we are not to add to them, that we are not to take away from them, that if we add to God's words, he will rebuke us and prove us a liar. Jesus never used the word Trinity, nor will you find it anywhere in the Bible. This is a term that was invented hundreds of years after Jesus lived on the earth by church leaders who wanted to make an attempt at defining what they believed about who God is. So 
they came together and decided to invent a term that would sum up what they believed about the mystery of God and that would set them apart from other people who didn't understand it the same way that they did. And the term they came up with was God in three persons or three persons in one essence. Now, if you talk to a diehard Trinitarian and you ask them what Arianism is, they would tell you that Arianism is a heresy and that anyone who believes in Arianism is not truly a Christian. And so most of us who believe in the Trinity say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. For those of us who are Christians who just have a general idea about what the Trinity means, that most of us just think it means that, that God's the Father God is the Son and God is the Holy Spirit and that Jesus Christ is fully God. And that's what most people understand the doctrine to mean. Although there are more details involved in um, what Trinitarians believe. And um, we assume that these other people over here who don't believe in the Trinity, well, they're not Christians because they, they probably don't even believe that, that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, we make all kinds of assumptions. The truth of the matter is that there were different factions, Trinitarians, Trinitarianism, um, there was Arianism, and there were other factions of people who understood the mystery of God in different ways, and they were all fighting with each other. That is the reality of what was happening. So in essence, what the formation of this doctrine produced in the body of Christ was a division. And we know that it was not a holy division because the word Trinity isn't even in the Bible. Now, many of you are very surprised to hear me say this because, again, the foundation of what you believe is that you believe in the Trinity. That's one of the foundational principles upon which you've built your faith. But this is what the Lord is saying to you today, that if you build on any other foundation besides Jesus Christ and obeying his words, then your foundation has been built on sinking sand and whatever you build on that sinking foundation will not stand. So if you have built your faith upon an idea that, that was created by human beings, if you have built your foundation not on the teachings of Jesus Christ per se, but a doctrine that came out of the teachings of Jesus Christ and our own human interpretations of what Jesus said, then you have built on sinking sand. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is a foundational doctrine about who God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are and how they relate to one another, God said it will not be revealed to you in any other way besides through Jesus Christ because no one else has seen God besides Jesus. No one knows the Son except for the Father, and no one knows the Father except for the Son, and it is through the Son that God has chosen to reveal His mysteries to us. If Jesus himself did not teach about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in terms of a trinity, then how dare we put words in his mouth? Do you understand what we are saying when we say that we have to create a doctrine to better describe or explain what Jesus was trying to say in the Holy Scriptures? We're saying that Jesus is not a good enough teacher for us. And in our estimation, he needs our help to kind of, you know, better communicate what he was trying to say. Do you understand how arrogant that is? And not only do we do this, but we take our doctrine and we allow ourselves to become puffed up in pride, believing that our way of explaining the mystery of God is the only way and that it's perfectly justified for us to exclude other people from fellowship based upon the fact that they don't agree with our words and doctrines. How dare you do that? Now, certainly Jesus did teach us about God. Jesus has a lot to say about these three persons that we like to call the Trinity. When it comes to understanding the mystery of how these three entities can all be God at the same time, can all be one with each other and yet be separate entities. And um, when it comes to understanding how those entities interact with each other and with us, God has revealed those things through his word. And we are going to talk about that in the series to come. However, you will not be able to hear it, nor will you be able to understand 
offended until you humble yourself to the word of God. Because as long as in your arrogance, you believe that your knowledge is better than the simple words that Jesus spoke to you, you will not be able to hear what he has to say to you. When we attempt to define an eternal God, you have to understand that the word define means to put limits on. The root of that word means to set a boundary or a limit. Okay? So what we are doing is we are creating old wineskins that will not hold an eternal God. The word Trinity is not an eternal word because it is not a word that came out of God's mouth. And if you think that you can contain the eternal God within the finite limits of a human word that has no life in it, then you are not humbling yourself to God. And God says that if you want to know his secrets, you have to be humble. He said, the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make them know his covenant. Now, I know that some of you are very shocked right now and some of you are concerned because you're saying, okay, does this mean that Monica doesn't believe that Jesus is God? Is she trying to teach us that he's not eternal or that he's not fully God or that the Holy Spirit isn't an actual spirit, but just the, the force or, or the will of God? But you see, these are the questions that we need to take and answer using scripture. The mistake comes when we ask questions and then answer them using human words, okay? There are elements of what most people understand the Trinity doctrine to be, and the reason I say that is because there is no standard to say, this is what the Trinity means. Different people have different understandings of what the Trinity means, okay? Because it's a human word and there's no written standard that you can go to and say, hey, this is the definition of the doctrine of the Trinity. It is something that developed over time um, as different people added their ideas and their understandings to it. But there are elements of what most of us understand the Trinity to mean that are from Scripture. Okay? And if we respect God and his words, we need to do what he said. He said, don't despise prophecy, okay? And you can get technical about what prophecy is, but really that's just somebody speaking what they are claiming is God's word, okay? They're saying, thus saith the Lord. And anytime somebody is asserting that they have a truth of God, then we need to apply this. It says you test everything and then you hold on to what is good. And what is good is what we find in scripture. Even Jesus did not define himself as good. But when somebody came to him and said, hey, you're the good teacher, he said, whoa, 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 why are you calling me good? There's only one that is good. So understand he was giving us an example of what a good teacher does. If you're really a good teacher, then you're not going to take credit for being a good teacher yourself, but you're going to point back to God's words over and over and say, hey, it's not me that's good. It's God's word that is good. So what does the Bible say? Okay, and that is what we need to do with all these elements that make up what we understand of the Trinity. Okay, so we're going to address some of these questions. We're going to address who Jesus is, who God the Father is, and the mystery of who the Holy Spirit is. And this is going to be a very exciting time, brothers and sisters. I don't want to diminish this to you. Please understand that God is revealing his word to the body right now. And Jesus said, you know, that he was going to continue to reveal himself to us. He even said to the disciples, he said that he had revealed himself to them. At the same time, he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them or to take them upon you or to grasp them. And he tells us in many places that he's going to continue to reveal truth to us. It says that he'd send us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. So though there is no new revelation that has not been written in the word of God, there is revelation that we come to understand as the Holy Spirit reveals to us what is clearly written in the word of God. And there are some surprises in store for us, ladies and gentlemen, things that we have been blind to. There are some things that have been largely ignored in scripture about the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is. As we move forward in this series, God is going to give us the keys in Scripture to understand this mystery that has baffled theological minds for centuries, and He's going to do it in such a way that we can actually understand it. So if you want to go on, 
If you want to hear what the Lord has to say to you, if you want to learn who he really is, then the first thing that you've got to do is get rid of the boundaries that you've put around him because he's not going to fit in those boundaries, you guys. And when you look at his word, you're going to reject every scripture that doesn't fit into your doctrine, Trinitarian or otherwise. It's time to shed the human words. It's time to take what we think we know, bring it out into the light and test everything according to the word of God. And any word that is used to describe God that is not in the Bible, that God did not use, that did not come out of God's mouth, we throw it in the garbage. Garbage, okay, any idea, any philosophy, we throw it in the garbage because what we're doing is we're busting down those fences, those definitions of God that we put up, those uh, those attempts at, at putting boundaries on who God is allowed to be in, in our world, <laughs> okay? We're busting those things down and we're saying, I'm throwing this old wineskin away and I'm gonna let God make me into a new wineskin. I'm gonna become like a little child so that I can enter his kingdom, so that I can understand what he is trying to teach me. I'm going to become teachable by humbling myself to his word, okay? And you guys, the reason that God is coming with a really strong warning on this one, and this is something that cuts most of us because most of us have always just gone around saying, oh yeah, I believe in the Trinity. All Christians believe in the Trinity, right? But what we have to understand is that when we make statements like that, what we are doing is excluding anyone who doesn't choose to use that terminology in order to express what they believe about God, instead of using the criteria that Jesus used in order to define who is a Christian and who is not. Okay, Jesus never said, you are not a Christian if you don't believe in the Trinity. That never came out of his mouth. And how dare you make that judgment God is the one who judges the hearts of men. This is what Jesus said. He said, if you want to be my disciple, then you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. He said, anyone who loves me will obey my commands. He said to the people around him, the people that were following him, if you hold to my teachings, then you are really my disciples. And what did Jesus teach, ladies and gentlemen? He taught us that we are to love God with all of our hearts and we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And you have to understand that when we face Jesus, he's not going to look at us and say, um, you know, what I really need to know is, do you believe in the Trinity? The Bible doesn't say that he's going to ask us that question. He's not going to look at us and say, you know, I really need to know if you believed that I had a beginning somewhere before the ages and the creation that I was actually begotten and that there was some point in eternity at which I was actually created or made. Or did you believe that I was always eternal and I never had any beginning? Jesus isn't going to be asking you these kind of esoteric questions, you guys. And these are the things that Trinitarians, diehard Trinitarians, fight over. If you ask a diehard Trinitarian what Arianism is, they would tell you that it's heresy and that anyone who believes in that kind of philosophy is not a Christian. But the truth of the matter is that the Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved that anyone who acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ has the Holy Spirit. They can only do that if they have the Holy Spirit. And they acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the King, by obeying his commandments. And he said that anyone who denies that he's the Christ, that person has the spirit of Antichrist. That's how Jesus told us to determine what spirit is in a person whenever it is necessary to do so. We do not have the right to look at someone and on the basis of a difference in human words that describes something that happened way before creation and that describes something that is beyond our comprehension anyway. Anyone who takes those kinds of words and tries to divide the body of Christ over them is somebody who is sowing division in the bride of Christ. And you have to understand this. The Bible says that there is no division in Christ. I'm going to say that again because you need to let this sink in. There is no division in Christ. The truth is, brothers and sisters, and this is the thing that should cause you to shake in your boots. The truth is that if you divide yourself off from another group of people who call themselves Christians and you say, well, they say they're Christians, but they're really not. 
If you do that and Jesus makes a determination that those people that you divided from are actually obeying his commandments and that they are Christians indeed, if you have separated yourself from them, then you have separated yourself from the body of Christ because there are no divisions in Jesus Christ and he is not going to exclude these people just because you want him to. You will be put out of the assembly. You will be cut out of the body. You will be cut off from the wedding feast. And if you don't want that to happen to you, you need to get the fear of God real fast. My father makes it very clear. He says, I hate those who sow dissension among the brothers. What resulted when this, these groups of spiritual leaders got together and started trying to define these, um, these mysteries of God using words of human wisdom, which is totally forbidden by the scriptures. What happened when these different groups started to do this is that they became different groups, factions, people following after the doctrines of man, people following after other people, other spiritual teachers. These are the people that the scriptures were talking about in 2 John 1, 9 through 10. I read it to you at the beginning. Now I'm going to read it to you again in the Amplified Version. He said, anyone who runs on ahead of God and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, who is not content with what Jesus taught, does not have God. But he who continues to live in the doctrine, teaching of Christ does have God. He has both the Father and the Son. If you are not content with what Jesus taught, if you feel the need to run on ahead of him and say, well, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run to another doctrine. When you do this, the Bible has an instruction for the body of Christ concerning you. The Bible says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, if they are not loyal to what Jesus taught, do not receive him. Do not accept him. Do not welcome or admit him into your house or bid him Godspeed or give him any encouragement. And that is the reception that you are going to get from the body of Christ if you continue to cling to human doctrines and divisions. Again, scripture is very clear that if you create divisions and factions within the body, that you will be excluded from the body. Jesus told us what he's going to say to us. He told us how he is going to judge us. Okay, and it has nothing to do with the theology of whether or not Jesus was created at some point in time or whether he was eternal as a separate being or only eternal as a part of God somehow inside of God. He's not going to ask you those questions and he's not going to judge you and make the declarations of how he judges you based upon what you believed about that stuff. Not only is Jesus not going to be shocked, but he's not going to be disappointed if you stand before him having not quite been able to grasp everything that he is and how everything happened before the beginning of the world. In fact, he told us that right now we see through a mirror dimly. Okay. He told us that right now we only know in part and we prophesy in part. That means that there are some aspects of his being that are still going to be a mystery to us that we're not going to fully grasp until the day that he appears. But the Bible does tell us that he's going to have some things to say to us, you guys. Okay. He's going to look at you and he's going to say, either you fed me when I was hungry you gave me something to drink when I was thirsty. When I was the least important Christian that you knew, I came to you and I was a stranger and you took me into your house. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Or he's going to say the opposite. He's going to look at you and say, you know, I came to you as the least of my brethren. I came to you as a Christian that you didn't think amounted to very much. I came to you in that form and I was hungry and you did not give me anything to eat. You did not take care of my needs. You did not love me. You did not visit me when I was in prison. He's not going to say, did you believe in Arianism or Trinitarianism? He's going to say, do you love me? If Jesus comes to you in this form, if he comes to you in the form of anybody that has a need and you're too busy 
arguing with them and putting forth your knowledge and showing how much you know and showing why you're right and they're wrong. If you're too busy doing that to take care of their needs, then Jesus is not going to look at you and pat you on the head and say, well, congratulations, you're a Trinitarian, you're in. He's going to look at you and he said, you did not love me. You did not feed me. You did not clothe me. You did not give me a drink and you are gone. It says as much again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, let's say that you have a right. Let's say that you really have a grasp on this, these eternal concepts of how God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one and what their relationships are to each other and who was eternal and who was begotten and who was created and who wasn't. Okay, let's say that you really have it all right, but you fail to take care of that person. This is what the Bible says. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Now, besides the fact that we put ourselves in danger of condemnation, besides the fact that we harm the body of Christ when we cause these divisions using human terms, there are other negative things that happen when we try to use our own words to define God. And it's, it's especially negative if you actually have a heart that wants to know the truth about God and his mysteries. Because what happens, you guys, what we do and it's a very human thing to do is take the very things in scripture that we know are incomprehensible. The theologians that hold to Trinitarianism or any other kind of ism, they'll tell you that the idea of the Trinity is something that our minds can't even really comprehend. Okay. But at the same time, they take something that they admit that they can't understand, that they can't comprehend, and they insist that they can teach about it. <laughs> Again, you guys, it's not a good idea to try to teach about something that you don't understand. Okay. Now, the reason that we do this is because of fear and because of pride. First of all, we're afraid of anything we don't understand. And so we have a need to take the mysteries that we see in scriptures, maybe scriptures that we don't understand how they can possibly work together. Um, something that may even seem to be a contradiction to our understanding. When we see these things, it bothers us and it scares us. Okay. And we, we can't feel comfortable until we have that thing explained away and defined. Okay. And then the other reason is, of course, our pride. We don't want to admit that we don't know something. <laughs> we want to be the person that understands it all, right? But we have to learn to be patient and to trust our rabbi when he says the words to us that we don't want to hear. The words that he said to his disciples in John 16, 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them or to take them upon you or to grasp them. We don't want to hear from God that we're not ready to understand the mystery yet. We want to know it all right now. If we have patience and if in the meantime, while we are waiting for these great mysteries to be unveiled to us, we do what Jesus told us to do, which is not to go and study all of the theories about what everybody thinks about God, but instead to go and live out the life of God by loving other people, by sacrificing what we have and laying down what we have for other people living out the love of God in that way, loving God and loving our neighbors. If we will do this, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of us and will guide us into all truth. Okay. That means that it's a process. It's a journey. You're not going to have it all at one time. Okay. And you're certainly not going to have it until you have learned the humility of obeying the simple commands of Jesus. The good news about this is that you don't even have to be smart to understand the, the mysteries of God. God can reveal his mysteries to little children. That's what Jesus said. He said, I thank you, God of heaven and earth. I thank you because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and you have revealed them to little children. If you want Jesus to reveal to you who God is and if you want God to reveal to you who the son is, then he will do it. But first, you have to learn to obey. So definitively from the scriptures, we can answer the question, do you have to believe in the Trinity in order to be a Christian? And the answer is, since Jesus never taught about the Trinity, since he never used those terms and he never defined his doctrine 
in that way, the answer is no, you don't have to believe in the words of human wisdom in order to have eternal life and to be a Christian. In order to be a Christian, according to the scriptures, you have to be born of water and born of the Holy Spirit. You have to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ and that he is God, that he is the son of God. Okay. Because if you read the scriptures that tell us about the Messiah, that those scriptures let us know that the Messiah is indeed also God. So we have to humble ourselves to the fact that he is the king, that he is to be obeyed, and we have to obey Jesus commands. So that is what you have to do in order to become a Christian. You have to call on the name of the Lord, trusting in Jesus Christ, believing in everything that he said and doing what he told you to do in order to be saved. That's what the Bible says. And anybody who tells you that you have to believe in the Trinity, anyone that tells you that you have to go outside of the written word of God in order to find out what you have to believe in order to be a Christian is not speaking with the authority of Jesus. Jesus Christ, and you are not to give them any room. You are not to give them authority. You are not to give them any encouragement in what they're trying to teach. And m- more importantly, you're not to be one of them. Okay. <laughs> Jesus didn't tell us to bow to human wisdom. He told us human wisdom is foolishness to him. He tells us that we are to bow to him and him alone. And if we do bow to the words of human wisdom and doctrines, that is idolatry in his sight. He doesn't want you to have any other teacher because he's jealous over you. He said, he's going to be your teacher and the Holy Spirit is going to lead you into all truth. Now, at this point, we've got two groups of people watching this video. We've got the people who are appalled at the idea that we would get rid of the term Trinity and throw it in the garbage, even though it's not a word that ever came out of God's mouth. Okay. And these people are going to fight until they're blue in the face. And if you let them, they'll fight with you until you're blue in the face too. Okay, but the Bible says that we are not to have anything to do with people who want to engage us in quarreling and arguing over human words. Okay, so we just simply can have nothing to do with people like that. Okay, however, there's another group of people who really want to know what God has to say in his word. And now that we have answered that question definitively, we have the final word on the subject from the written word of God. We can move on to what God has to show us in the body of Christ in these last days. And this is very exciting, brothers and sisters, because now God is going to reveal to us who he is, not God in three persons, three and only three persons, as we have always come to believe that he is, but the God that he has revealed to us in scripture, the God of seven spirits. And that is what we're going to talk about in the series to come. So I hope that you will join me. And until I see you next time. Be blessed. Today we'll praise you in the morning. I will praise you in the day. I will praise you in the evening. I will praise. And I will praise you in the morning. I will praise you in the day. TikTok TV is funded exclusively by viewers like you. If you would like to make a donation online, you can do so at www.tiktok.tv or you can send your donation to TikTok Ministries, P.O. Box 155155, Irving, Texas 75015.